So good afternoon. My name is Dr. Richardson, and this is lecture 10 of the course entitled Using Vector Calculus to Solve Problems in Electricity and Magnetism. And again, some administrative issues. Please take notes. Learning is an active process. You'll get nothing by just sitting back and watching me or anybody else for, anybody else for that matter, simply performing in front of a blackboard or whiteboard, either electronic or real. Um, take notes throughout the course. You wait to take notes throughout the lecture. Review the notes, excuse me, at home or at a quiet place. Uh, you have to do the problem sets. You won't learn anything by simply looking at the solutions. And even if you get stuck on a problem, when you get the solutions, don't look at them completely. Cover them with a sheet of paper and just scroll down line by line, see if you can get some hints on how to do it. You learn by making mistakes. That's the key point here. Uh, in terms of problem sets, problem set nine and problem set uh, nine, problem set nine, the solutions and the problem set, they were already posted on the Google Drive site earlier this week. So I posted the solution key to problem set nine earlier this week, early. Problem set, um, eight, um, there were some minor revisions I had to make. So those will be posted uh, sometime this weekend. And problem set 10 will probably be posted online probably by Tuesday of next week. You can always ask questions. Uh, there's a recitation section after the end of the lecture from 3.30 to 5. And you can send me questions uh, directly through my email address listed above. And I find a rule to be useful in terms of writing notes and also solving problems. So we are going to start so far, we're going to start at the moment with a review of what we've done with the problem of electrostatics so far. Um, fundamental rule observation from of electrostatics is Coulomb's law, which simply says, suppose you have two point charges, Q and Q prime, and let's say they're, de they're separated in space by some distance R, and I need unit vectors always just to tell me and the audience what I'm doing. So let's define a unit vector R hat accordingly. So Coulomb's law simply says that if you have these two point charges, there's a vector force, a vector field between those two point charges. That vector force is radial. It depends on the square of the magnitude of the two charges, Q and Q prime, and it's an inverse square law. So I want to say something about units here. Charge comes in units of coulombs. Length comes in units of meters. Um, if you look at the left-hand side, on uh, the right-hand side of this equation, we'll have something that goes like Coulomb squared over a meter squared. The thing on the left-hand side is a force. So that's a mass, kilograms, times an acceleration, meters per second squared. And that's a lot to deal with. So we're just going to summarize that and call a force a Newton, capital N. So to make these left, the left hand and the right hand sides equivalent dimensionally, it's clear to see that epsilon naught, the permittivity of free space, we've talked about it a lot, but we've never actually sat down and figured out what units it has to have. It has to have units of Coulomb squared over meter squared times Newton. Um, so that if you take the inverse of that, you will get rid of a Coulomb squared and a meter squared on the right hand side and you just be left with Newtons on the left. So Coulomb's law tells you something very important. It says that if you have two point charges, Q and Q prime, and they both have the same magnitude, they're both positive or they're both negative, the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, Q prime, will experience a force. And 
that force will be in the direction of the unit radial vector r hat. And so that means that it will be repelled or it will experience a repulsive force. So it's very easy to reverse this process if you want to look at the force on charge Q due to Q prime, then the unit vector of R hat would have an opposite direction. And again, same story, if both of these charges Q and Q prime are either positive or negative, then in fact Q will experience or see a force that's going to be in the positive R hat direction where R hat is defined accordingly here. And that force will also be repulsive. So baked into Coulomb's law is the observation that like charges repel. How about unlike charges? So let's get rid of our units. So I claim we're comfortable with them now. And so here, the situation is going to be a little different. Suppose, in fact, Q is positive and Q prime is negative, or the other way around, really doesn't matter. In that case, the product of these two guys will be negative. And if you are Q prime, you will see or feel or experience a force in the minus I heart I hat direction as defined by my system there. So that force is going to be attractive. And same story if you in fact ask the question, well, suppose you're not worried about the force on Q prime, but let's worry about the force on Q. You can address that issue by just defining a unit vector in that direction. And so if that's what's going on in play, if the two charges are such that they have opposite charges, they were oppositely charged, so their product is negative, then Q experiences a force, and you have this negative sign here, so it's going to be in the minus I heart direction, I hat direction also. And so that means it's going to be attracted. So it's going to see an attractive force. So Coulomb's law tells you that there's a force between two point charges. That force is radial. That force goes like one over the separation distance squared. And like charges will repel, unlike charges will attract. So the next question we worried about was what happens not between two point charges, but at a single point in space? So in that case, we define something called the electric field which said the following. Here you have your charge Q, my source charge, and my test charge Q prime. And Coulomb's law says that there's a force acting on Q prime. Well, the amazing thing is that you can get rid of this test charge Q prime. And there's still something going on in this point in space, at this point in space. You know that because when you reintroduce that, 
Q prime there, it sees a force. So that something else that happens at that point in space is the fact that you have a vector field. It's a very special vector field. You have an electric field at that point in space. And it's due to the point charge Q. And again, it goes like one over R squared and it's radial. Um, the units of the electric field formally, I mean, we'll come back to this in a minute. Formally, it's a force divided by a charge. So it's a Newton divided by a Coulomb, um, but that's not what people use for units of, of electric field. So we'll, um, it's a volt actually. So we'll, we'll look at this later. So again, at this point in space, if you have a source charge Q and you're looking at a, a point of space as in space that's a distance R from Q, you have at that point uh, R a vector field, an electric field E. It depends upon, it's a vector and it depends upon a position vector. So it's got lots of components to it. So how do we find the electric field? Well, formally, we know what it is for a single point charge. If you have a collection of point charges and all you have to do is add them up, because the principle of superposition tells you that the net electric field generated is just going to be due to each one of those points considered separately. So this electric field, it's going to be a little bit beyond the scope of these lectures, but it is a real physical thing. It has energy, it has momentum has linear momentum and it actually has angular momentum. But again, we're, we're not gonna get into those details. They're interesting, but we're not gonna talk about them. So this has a real physical meaning. So there are a number of ways to calculate it. If you have a single isolated point charge, simply that. If you have a distribution of isolated point charges in space, you can do it this way. Suppose you have a distribution of charges, a continuous distribution of charges, then the calculus tells you you're gonna to have to sum up all these small pieces of charge or you're gonna to have to do an integral. We certainly have done that many times in this course where we replaced our hat by the position vector and to get rid of the fact that R hat depends upon where you are in space. If you want to do this integral, the price you pay is that R squared and then the denominator becomes R cubed. Um, and finally, there's a fourth way to find an electric field. And it only works for very special cases of symmetry and that's Gauss's law. So as I said uh, a few lectures ago, Gauss's law is always true. And it's true for any Gaussian surface, not a spherical surface, but the bear of the problem is doing that surface integral. And it really only is a pleasant chore to attend to if you have a system of high symmetry. So most of the time, you have to do the work this integral formally. Okay. So this is a nice slide, but buried underneath it are at least 15 problems that we've done. Writing down these expressions, one, two, three, four, is nice to understand the basis of the theory, but you really won't understand the theory until you apply these two examples, hence the problem sets. Okay, so um, 
that's all a review so far. So let's go a little bit further, ask some new questions. How much work? Some of this is a review and some of this is new, but it's okay to look at this with fresh eyes. How much work, work does it take to assemble a system of, in this case, the system is going to be extremely simple. It's going to be a system of two charge, two point charges, Q and Q prime. And we're going to separate me. We're going to separate these two point charges by a distance. And for reasons that will become clearer in a few minutes, we're going to introduce the notation Q12. So here's my line. Here is Q, my source charge. Here's my test charge, Q prime. And I'm going to call this distance R12. OK, so I want to come along with the problem. The problem I want to deal with is I want to come along and take a charge Q prime, my test charge, from infinity and move it so that it lies at the position R sub 1, 2 with respect to Q. And then I want to nail these charges down on the whiteboard. So Q will be fixed, Q prime will be fixed, so they won't move. So the question is, so here's the system we have. So the question is, how much work does it take to bring Q prime from infinity to a distance R sub 1, 2 with respect to Q, and then fix Q prime there? Fix Q. They don't move. They don't move through the entire process. Q never moves. It's fixed. So mechanics tells us that work is just a force times a distance. And you can express the work as a line integral. You just have to worry about the path over which you're doing this. If you're going to do work on this system, you have to fight Coulomb's law because Coulomb's law is going to tell the system, Q and Q prime, how to react to each other. So if you want to do an experiment where you bring Q in and Q prime in and you put it at this point here, you're going to have to fight Coulomb's law. Hence, you need a minus sign. You must fight Coulomb. Not personally, but you have to go against his, his empirical law. And you can do that mathematically by writing it in. It's Q times Q prime divided by 4 pi epsilon naught R squared. There's a unit vector R hat dotted into dr. And you can evaluate this elementary integral and it's just Q times Q prime over four pi epsilon naught R. And I have to evaluate this between the limits of integration, R12 and infinity. And that's just going to be Q, Q prime over four pi epsilon naught R12. R12, where 1, 2 is, is a subscript. Okay, so that's the answer for this particular simple problem. Now, just because you can write an expression down doesn't know, mean that you know it's telling you what it's, it's trying to tell you. You have to sit down and look at it. So let's, let's do that. So the work needed 
to establish that system of two point charges separated by distance r sub one two goes like this. The numerator is as units of Coulomb squared. The denominator goes like a meter squared. The permittivity of free space again is charge squared or Coulomb squared over Newton meter squared. And work will have units of Newton per meter. Work is force times the distance. And that's a lot to carry around. So we're just going to call that a joule. And that will have a unit of energy. So work is energy. So look at this expression and make sure we understand what it's telling us. If the two charges have the same sign, they're both negative or positive, and their product is positive. So that implies the work is positive. So that tells you that you must do work on the system to beat Coulomb's law. When you think about it, it makes common sense. It makes a lot of sense. If the two charges are positive, then they want to repel each other. If you're going to bring Q prime in from infinity, as you bring Q prime closer into Q, you're going to have to fight that repulsive force. You're going to have to do work on the system. Similarly, if the charges have opposite signs, their product is negative. So what's happening in this case is that the system is doing work on you. And in fact, if you want to pull Q prime away from the system, then you're going to have to fight it. So that's why W is negative in this case. Because the natural thing is for the two charges, Q and Q prime, to be attracted to each other. So you have to come in and beat that force. Um, and you have to do it in a way to, again, beat Coulomb's law. So negative work means something. You just have to sit down and carefully apply it to the problem at hand. And in this case, the system is doing work on you. So work and energy are actually related. In a very fundamental way in elementary mechanics, known as the work energy theorem, which simply says that if you do work on a system, and the beautiful thing about this uh, theorem is that you don't have to tell me what the system is, that you don't have to define the system at this point. We're doing it in the context of electrostatics, but it's true for mechanics, it's true in thermodynamics, it's true in lots of different systems. So if you do work on a system, this work goes into increasing energy of a system. The work gets converted into energy. So for the two-point charge system that we just discussed, this work is going to get converted into energy, and this energy will define by the symbol U, and we'll call this the electro static potential energy. Of the system. And again, it has units of joules. 
So I call it potential energy. Why do I call it potential energy? I call it potential energy because remember what we're doing. I have my point charge Q, it's fixed. I have another charge Q prime that is, a, at, that is located at infinity. I bring it into the proximity of Q and I lock it down, I nail it right down there so that it is a distance R from Q. So both Q and Q prime are fixed. And I claim that the work done to create this system goes into electrostatic potential energy. So I can see that in a nice simple way. Suppose I connect those two fixed point charges, Q and Q prime, by a string. And then suppose I unfix Q and Q prime from the whiteboard, and then I cut the string. You know what's going to happen. Those two charges are going to fly apart from each other. In other words, the energy that they have initially in this system is purely in the form of potential energy and it's going to get converted into kinetic energy once you allow those charges to move by cutting that string and unnailing those charges q and q prime from the whiteboard this is really conservation of energy right potential energy is converted entirely into kinetic energy Okay, so we have introduced the concept of get rid of this little smudge. We have introduced in this course the concept of electrostatic potential. And we've given this the symbol of V. And again, this is not in any way, shape, or form the same thing as the electrostatic potential energy. These are two different things, but they are related. Now, it's unfortunate. They both have names that are similar, and this certainly is the possibility of confusing these things when you first are introduced to them, but they're different. So the electrostatic potential energy for my two charge, two point charge system goes like one over R. Um, it's useful to remember that forces go like one over R squared. The electric field goes like one over R squared, the electrostatic potential energy goes like one over R, and as we'll see in a minute, the electrostatic potential, well, we already know this, but the electrostatic potential goes like one over R. So the electrostatic potential is defined to be the electrostatic potential energy divided by the test charge. Say this in words, the electrostatic potential is the electrostatic potential energy. Per unit charge. So let's worry about the units of this. Uh, the electrostatic potential energy has units of joule. Worker energy theorem tells us that uh, potential energy and work are the same. Charge has units of coulombs. 
So you could define the electrostatic potential as something as units of joules per charge, but we're gonna call that a volt. We'll measure the electrostatic potential in units of volts. And if you think about it, the electric field, since the electrostatic potential goes like the electric field times the distance, the electric field is gonna have units of volts per meter. That's a much more reasonable set of units to look at as opposed to the previous case where we talked about formerly electric field having units of newtons per coulomb. This is extremely important. Okay, so again, this is all a review. So what does the electrostatic potential mean and why is it useful? So first things first, the electrostatic potential, at least for the case of an isolated single point charge, it's a scalar, that's clear, but it has no physical meaning. The electrostatic potential is simply a mathematical quantity. So in some ways, when students first see this, they, you know, they're comfortable with the idea of Coulomb's law, they're comfortable with the idea of a force, they're complicated, they're comfortable with the idea of the electric field, that's force per charge. They're comfortable with the idea of electrostatic potential energy that's related to work. But electrostatic potential, you know, it doesn't seem to have a physical meaning to it. And that's the point, it doesn't. <laughs> Simply a mathematical quantity. So why is it useful? <coughs> Excuse me. Well, it's useful because as we saw and exploited, in lots of previous problems, that the electric field and the electrostatic potential are related. Again, the electric field goes like a creature that has units of volts per meter. Meter dr is a uh, uh, displacement vector, has units of meters, so the electrostatic potential is measured in terms of uh, units of volts. Same thing is true in the second expression. And the utility of the electrostatic potential raises its wonderful head when you realize that scalars are easier to deal with than vectors. Vectors, you have to decompose them into components, either Cartesian, cylindrical polar, spherical polar, or preaching to the choir. You know how much work is involved in this? We've done this, we've seen this. Scalars are much easier to do. So in fact, if you can simply just spend your time finding the electrostatic potential, that's a much easier task to tackle because you don't have to do an integral involving vectors. It's just an integral involving scalars. And then at the end of the day, you'll just take minus the gradient of that electrostatic potential and you'll get the electric field. Okay, so there is a very nice way to summarize all 
of this, finish our review. And a nice little table. So one side of the table will address the question of how do two charges, sorry, I seem to fade it out a bit there, but here we are. How do two charges interact? Okay, so if you're two-point charges, if you are a system comprised of two-point charges, you'll interact through a force. That force is Coulomb's law. That force is defined by Coulomb's law. Now, if you have two single point charges, Q and Q prime, you have a system that contains energy. That system contains potential energy. That potential energy is what we'll call electrostatic potential energy. And it's just Q times Q prime divided by four pi epsilon naught R. So that is the electrostatic potential energy. Please note that the force in Coulomb's law goes like one of R squared, but the electrostatic potential energy, I probably should capitalize my energy here, right? She goes like one over R. Okay. So on this part of the graph or in my slide, I want to pull out something, some quantity that I can discuss that doesn't depend upon two distinct points, but just at a single point in space. table. And I can do that by introducing the electric field. That's really a definition. And the electric field is just the force per test charge Q prime. But the important thing now is I have generated something that just depends upon Q. And at everywhere in space, there is a vector field called the electric field, which is a real quantity. It has energy and momentum. And you can measure it. And you can see how it interacts with my test charge Q prime if you put it at any point in space around Q. So this is my electric field. And the idea of the electric field is it tells you what happens at a single point in space. It's an extension of Coulomb's law. There is a similar extension for the electrostatic potential energy. It only depends upon two separate point charges, Q and Q prime. But you can define something that is just related to a single point charge. That's the electrostatic potential. So this is the electrostatic potential. And the electrostatic potential, which has units of volts, is a number, so it's a scalar field, but it's a number that just has convenience in the sense that its, it's major uses, it allows you to calculate electric fields very easily by just calculating the electrostatic potential and then just taking minus the gradient of it. Physically, it doesn't mean anything. It's just a point in space. So it's a point, it's a mathematical point in space generated by some charge distribution, either a single isolated point charge, a set of discrete point charges, or a continuous charge distribution. Okay. So if you ever get confused with the idea of an electrostatic potential, 
it's always useful to go back and look at a diagram like this where you see how you get an electric field from the force in Coulomb's law, and then you subsequently see how you get an electrostatic potential from the electrostatic potential energy. Both the electric field and the electrostatic potential are ways to define what's going on at a single point in space, which is an extremely useful thing. Okay, so that really ends our review. So let's start talking about some new ideas. Namely, since we're familiar with this idea of work, let us ask and answer the following question. How much work is needed or required to assemble a system of point charges. Okay. So one at a time, first case is, suppose you have a single charge. You have a single point charge and you wanna move it from infinity to some point in space. You don't have to do any work because there aren't any other charges in the system, okay? So there's no work as far as electrostatics is concerned. If you take into account the gravitational field and the mass of the particle, yeah, there's work there, but just in terms of electrostatics, there's no work. So now let's look at the case of two point charges. And we have done this, so let me remind you. Here's a point in space, R prime, denoted by a vector r prime, here's another point in space r prime, and let's say at r prime, oh sorry, r sub one and r sub two. So here's a position, position vector r sub one, here's a position vector r sub two. So once you specify an origin, they tell you about where you are in space. So let's say I nail to R1, a charge Q sub one. And then let's say I bring in from infinity another charge Q sub two, and I locate it at R sub two, and I pin it there. So Q1 is pinned at R sub 1, Q2 is pinned at R sub 2. So there's a distance between them, which we'll call R sub 1, 2. So I know this answer. The work needed to assemble this system of point charges is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught times Q1, Q sub 1 times Q sub 2 divided by R sub 1, 2, the interparticle distance, the distance between the two charges. So I want to extend this argument to look at three point charges or four point charges or 16 point charges or n point charges. And it's very easy to do that. Namely, I recognize that the principle of superposition comes to my rescue. And this process of doing work to bring in new charges to the system is done in a way that has nothing to do, it's not impeded or diminished by what you did 
to bring in other charges. So what am I talking about? So here's Q1 at R sub one, it's fixed, it's pinned there. Here's Q sub two at R sub two, it's fixed or pinned there. And I want to bring into my system a new charge and place it at the position vector R sub three. That new charge will be Q sub three. So I will have three distances to worry about, R sub two, three, R sub one, three, and R sub one, two. So the principle of superposition tells me that the work needed to bring Q3 in, Q sub 3 in from infinity, place it at the position vector R sub 3, pin it there. And again, in this process, Q1 and Q sub 1 and Q sub 2 are pinned at the position vectors R sub 1 and R sub 2. They're not moving. This work is just going to be four, 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. Uh, let's give ourselves a little bit more space. So this work is going to be W sub work sub three. It's going to be one over four pi epsilon naught Q sub three times Q sub one divided by R sub one three, which is the same as R sub three one plus Q sub two divided by R sub two three, which is the same as R sub two three is the same as R sub three two. Okay. And keep going on. How much work? Suppose you have Q sub one, Q sub two, Q sub three. They're all fixed, pinned at positions designated by the relative position vectors R sub one, R sub two, R sub three. And you bring in another vector or another a charge, Q sub four. You pin it at a position vector R sub four. And you want to ask how much work did you have to do? to do exactly what we just said. And the answer there is Q sub four times three quantities. Q sub one times, Q sub one divided by R sub one four plus Q sub two divided by R sub two four plus Q sub three divided by R sub three four. I haven't drawn this similar picture in, but you can imagine doing that. So, what is the total work required to assemble our So what's the total work required to assemble our system of four charges? Well, that's just W, that's R sub two, I'm sorry, it's W, that's W sub two plus W sub three plus W sub four. And I can write that out. Remember, W sub two had two contributions to two terms to it. W sub three. All right, W sub uh, two had one one term. Let me go back and look at that. Just had one term. W sub three had two terms, and W sub four had three terms. So my answer is going to have to have six terms. You can write them all out. You have Q sub one, Q sub two divided by R sub one, two plus Q sub one, Q sub three 
divided by r sub 1, 3, plus q sub 1, q sub 4, divided by r sub 1, 4. So that's 3 down, 3 to go. q sub 2 times q sub 3, divided by r sub 2, 3. And again, you should do this. Take these three terms and add them up explicitly and prove to yourself that this is what you get. Q sub two times Q sub four divided by R sub two, R uh, sub two four. Um, and then the sixth and final term will be Q sub three times Q sub four divided by R sub three four. Okay. So that's the total work needed to put together a system of four point charges. Now you can imagine doing this for 30 charges, 10 charges, but you know, there's gotta be a simpler way to express all this to figure out what these terms are. And there is. So the general expression assemble a system of point charges with the general expression that you can write down. And that's simply going to be W. I have my ubiquitous constant of one over four pi epsilon naught. I always had that. I had problems. I had that when I did problems in electrostatics, when I calculated forces, when I calculated uh, electric fields, when I calculated electric potentials. And now I'm going to sum over i from one to n, q sub i. I'm going to sum over Q sub J, but I have to make sure that J does not equal I. So J can go from one to N, but it's ne J and I are never equivalent. So you're never going to get a term on the right hand side. It says Q sub six, Q sub times Q sub six. That sum is going to go to N. I have to divide this by the separation between those two point charges, R sub I J. And there's something that's missing. I need to put in a factor of one over two to avoid, this is so important, let's put this in writing, in red. I need this factor of one over two to avoid overcounting. In other words, I do not want to have in my, when I expand these terms out, a contribution like this is the same as a contribution like that. These are the same. So if I do this sum formally, I'll get these two terms in here. I have to get rid of them. And the way to get rid of them is just to divide by two. So you're gonna avoid overcounting. So really, this prefact that you want for the general expression for work needed to assemble a system of point charges really looks like one over eight pi epsilon from that. Where again, the sum over i goes from one to n, the sum over j goes from one to n, but if you give me a value of i, then j can't have that value. So look, you need to play with this expression. You need to pick, you know, a value of n, let's say four, and then formally expand this out to make sure you get what we just previously got. 
or three or two or 13, okay? But there's no way you can see what's going on unless you in fact do this. Finally, if you wanna be nice and formal, I mean, we're here and I'll just mention this at the moment, you could rewrite this expression entirely in terms of an electrostatic potential where there's just one sum and the sum over all the point charges goes inside here. So this expression conceals another sum. Okay, so it is useful to make sure that we're comfortable with this idea of electrostatic potentials and electrostatic, more importantly, electrostatic potential energy by going through some examples. So I'm gonna go through two examples. So example 10.1. I'm gonna have a system that looks as follows. I'll have a square. And my square will have a charge minus Q at the southeast corner. At the southwest corner, it will have a charge plus Q at the northwest corner, it will have a charge of minus Q. And at the moment, it will have nothing at the fourth corner. This square will have sides A. And this problem will have two parts. First, find the work bring a fourth charge, which we'll call positive Q, from infinity to the north east corner the square. That's the problem we had. Well, we've done this, right? We wrote down a general expression for it. The work needed to bring in a charge of value positive Q from infinity and place it here. That is what we call W sub four and it's one over four pi epsilon naught, Q sub four multiplied by Q, um, let's give us a little bit more space here. So W sub four is gonna be one over four pi epsilon naught, Q sub four times Q sub one divided by R sub one four, plus Q sub two divided by R sub two four plus Q sub three divided by R sub three four. Where in this problem, Q sub one is the southeast charge minus Q. Q sub two is the southwest charge plus Q. Q sub three is the northwest charge minus Q and Q sub four is my new charge and he is just plus Q. The other thing to recognize in this problem is that R sub one four, R sub two four, R sub three four are vectors that you're going to have to figure out what they are. Okay, given the trigonometry of the system, all I know is that this distance from here 
to here is A, but this distance here is A times the square root of two. So you are in a position to solve this problem and you should do it. And you'll find you'll get an answer of Q squared over four pi epsilon naught A. Again, work is an energy, it goes like one over a distance, and the rest should be dimensionalist. It's minus two plus one over the square root of two, which is dimensionalist, and it's just a geometric factor. Okay. And I will leave this exercise for you to do for problem set. Okay. All right, there's a second part of this problem that you can tackle. So let us keep the square. Let's get rid of all of this. This is superfluous at the moment. And then I said this example leads to a second problem. So in my second problem, let us suppose that I have already created this system. Where I have four charges at the corners of a square, each side has a length of A. And the question I wanna ask in this problem is, what is the work required to assemble this entire configuration. Of four separate charges. In other words, let's say I start out with empty space, and then from empty space, given empty space, I'm going to bring in from infinity charge Q, Q minus Q, Q, and minus Q, and place them at the corners of this square. How much work is that going to involve? So I will leave it up to you. You're going to need to recognize that you're going to create a system that has potential energy, and you can calculate that system, that potential energy, or you can calculate that work by just evaluating this sum i goes from 1 to n, j goes from 1 to n, but j never equals i. There's a factor of 1 over 8 pi epsilon naught. That includes a factor of 2 that avoids overcounting. And I have a Q sub i, Q sub j, divided by R sub i j. So I claim that the geometry of this system tells you exactly how to write out these terms. And I want you to do the problem in problem set 10 and find that the work needed is going to be 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught 2 q squared over a times a geometric factor of minus 2 plus 1 over the square root of 2. So that's something that you need to show. Okay. So we've looked at two examples of 
calculating the work needed to assemble a system of discrete point charges. Now let's look at a system that's not discrete, but a continuous charge distribution. And very specifically, I'm going to look at the case of a sphere of radius A. It has a volume charge density rho. So the question here is, how much energy is required to assemble this system? Well, the answer is the energy required is just the work done in gathering these charges together, in this case, these are point charges form a sphere. A sphere has radius A and volume charge density rho. So you might think that all you have to do is just go back to those sums and just add things up. And you know, that's going to be quite formidable. Well, you're going to do that, but you're going to do that using the mechanics of uh, integral calculus. So we're going to divide the problem up as follows. Suppose instead of looking at, so let's start from the beginning. Okay. So here's the problem at hand. I have my solid sphere radius A. And what I want to do is look at a smaller sphere has volume charge density rho. I just want to look at a smaller sphere of radius r and recognize that it has a charge associated with it. I'll call that q sub r and it's just four thirds pi r cubed times the volume charge density. Now this guy here is not the same thing as this. But to get from two to one, what I have to do is add to system two a shell, spherical shell. And that spherical shell is going to have a charge associated with it of dq, but that's just four pi r squared dr times rho, where the shell has radius dr, or that width is dr, the shell has radius r, and then this width, the shaded region is dr. Okay, so the work done in building this big sphere of radius A is just what you would get if you start out with system two 
it has a charge of Q sub R. And then you bring from infinity to the system Q2 a small amount of charge dq that's defined by this spherical shell. Now remember, you still want to, at the end of the day, get the original system R of uh, system number one. So that means you're going to have to integrate this guy from R equals zero to R equals A. And don't forget that, in fact, In my definition of electrostatic potential energy, there's a factor of four pi epsilon on R in the denominator. So, when you think about this, this sounds scary, but it's not. Q sub one, Q sub R is just the charge due to an established sphere of radius R. I know exactly what it is. It depends upon R and a constant rho. So, Rho in this problem is a volume charge density, and you want to make your life very easy. So you're going to make this constant. Make this a constant. DQ is the amount of charge that a spherical shell has that you bring in from infinity and essentially marry the system in Roman numeral two, and then you keep adding more shells until you build up a system that's equivalent to one. You keep integrating. So in fact, dq is in fact that. So you can do this integral. I'll leave it to you to do the problem set and you will discover that it is a scalar. It's a constant number. Depends upon the radius of the final circle, the final sphere, sorry, A. Depends upon the charge of the sphere. The charge is just the volume charge density times 4 thirds pi A cubed and constants 320 and epsilon naught. And these constants have to be artifacts of the integration. So I want you to show that this is true in problem set 10. Okay. And again, make sure you understand the idea. The idea is that we want to basically build our original sphere of volume A. So what we do is look at a smaller sphere of radius A, we calculate how much charge it has. Then we ask how much work is going to be involved to bring in a shell containing charge dq and adding it to that original small sphere of radius R. That's exactly what this integrand tells you. And then just keep doing that, keep building up the system, add more and more spherical shells, or let that dr get wider and wider and wider so that at the end of the day you have a sphere whose radius is the final desired result a and that's what this integration does for you so show that that's in fact true yeah. okay so i want us to say something about why electrostatic electrostatics is useful. And one use of electrostatics is to create an entire industry of electronics made of devices. And one of the first devices that you can talk about and discuss is something called a capacitor. And a capacitor has capacitance. So I'm going to spend a few minutes on this. Um, a lot of this you've seen before in elementary physics courses. We'll talk a little bit about this and we'll leave some exercises for you to do in problem set 10. 
All right, a couple of things. So remember, if you have an infinite charged sheet of surface charge density rho or sigma that we found many moons ago that the electric field was just sigma divided by two epsilon naught times a unit normal vector n hat. So the unit, the electric field generated by an infinitely charged sheet of surface charge density sigma is a constant everywhere in space. Okay, and this is nice, but the problem is that you don't have in real life infinite charge sheets. You in fact have finite charge sheets. So I wanna look at the problem where I have a charge sheet of surface charge density positive sigma and one of surface charge density negative sigma. So if I look at this system along the edge, I have three regions, region one, region two, and region three. So region in region one, I have an electric field. In region two, I have an electric field. And in region three, I have an electric field. The question is, what are those three creatures? We have done this problem before, so um, I don't have any problems with reviewing it. So again, this will be the positively charged uh, finite sheet, and this will be the negatively charged finite sheet. So first things first, there are electric fields generated due to the positively charged sheet in all these regions. In region one, there'll be an electric field that points in that direction. In region two, there'll be an electric field that points in that direction. And in region three, there'll be an electric field that points in that direction. And that's generated by uh, this positively charged sheet that has surface charge density sigma. And that just, and you'll know exactly what that is from a previous example using Gauss's law. And that's written down in the, in the uh, red box. Now, I also have a second sheet in this problem. It's finite. It has a minus negative surface charge density. So that means that as far as E minus is concerned, there'll be an electric field pointing in the minus n hat direction with regard to this negatively charged plate of surface charge density negative sigma in region three. There will be an electric field in region two that points in that direction. And there will be an electric field due to region in region one due to the plate that has a negative surface charge density sigma. And that will point in that direction. So what you see from this diagram is that there's no electric field outside of the system. In regions one and two, the electric fields vanish and there's only an electric field inside the system and it's two times the result. So it's sigma over epsilon naught and hat. So this system that I have created looks like this and has two parallel plates. One is charged with the surface charge density sigma, the other is minus sigma. Or another way to say that, a more convenient way of saying that, quite frankly, is that this is positively charged and this is negatively charged. 
let's put some coordinates in in this problem. Let's call this I hat, J hat, K hat. Let's say that the separation between these two plates is D, and then let's say the area of each plate is A. So if I look down, the system by using this coordinate system, this convention of unit vectors. So I hat points out of the whiteboard towards you. And this is my positively charged plate. This is my negatively charged plate. There are electric field vectors that point from the positively charged plate to the negatively charged plate. And I know exactly what that is. It's simply sigma over two epsilon naught and hat times two. So there's only a factor one multiplying the permittivity of free space and denominator. So that's important. But that's not really what happens in this system. The electric field vectors are going to do funny things at the edges. They're still called fringe effects that'll distort the electric field due to the fact that I don't have an infinite sheet charge of surface charge density sigma, it's finite. So I can do two things. I can worry about it or I can ignore it. Or let me rephrase that. I can ignore it and worry about the fringe effects later. So we have three things. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna ignore these fringe effects and see what happens where we just treat the electric field inside this device just by that. So this device has a name. It's called a two plate, or really a two parallel plate. Consider. Okay. And why are capacitors useful? Why are they something you either want to even want to discuss? A capacitor is a device that has one purpose in life. Its purpose is to store charge. That's all what a capacitor does. So, ignoring the fringe effects, we are going to say that our finite size capacitor looks like and behaves exactly like this. But even at the edge, the electric field, at the edges, the electric field is a constant. And again, this is the positive part, this is a negative part. Okay. So, how much charge? does my device or capacitor store? Again, remember what the device looked like.
have two parallel plates that are finite. They're separated by a distance d, and they each have the same area, A, and one plate is positively charged and the other is negatively charged. And there's an electric field inside between the two plates. The electric field is zero outside of the plates. We saw that before. And we ignore all fringe effects so that we can actually write down this expression for the electric field as a simplification. And again, sigma is just charge per unit area. <coughs> Excuse me. So for each one of these plates that has a surface area A, I can write down an electric field generated by um, inside this system. Electric field have vectors that are all constants and they'll point in that direction, ignoring fringe effects. Okay, so how much charge does this device or capacitor store? Well, charge, according to Coulomb's law, is certainly proportional to force. That's certainly proportional to an electric field, and that's certainly proportional to a voltage or potential or electrostatic potential, or an electrostatic potential difference. Please remember that the potential itself is not meaningful. It has to be referred to, to some reference point. So you always have a potential difference, again, you ask the question, uh, how tall is the Empire State Building or the Eiffel Tower in New York or the Eiffel Tower in Paris or Taj Mahal in India? You have to give your questioner some more data and you have to ref uh, refine your question so you're asking this with respect to some reference, typically the ground, the sidewalk. So charge and potential difference are related. So we will define the proportionality constant between potential difference and charge as something called the capacitor or capacitance, given by capital C. It will have units of coulombs per volts or farad. So all we have to do to calculate the capacitance of a system is we know what charge the system contains, how much charge the system contains, and what the potential difference is. The potential difference is easy to calculate in this problem. It involves a line integral of the electric field over the distance where it's contained, namely the separation distance D. The electric field, I know, dr I know, and I can evaluate this potential difference. It's just q d over a epsilon naught, and I typically want my capacitance to be a creature that's positive. So if in fact the potential difference in a problem is negative, I'll just take the absolute value of it. Again, the potential Electrostatic potential, electrostatic potential difference has the right units. D over A is just one over a distance, and charge is Q, so Coulomb per distance is a volt. So I can, in fact, calculate the capacitance of my two plate capacitor. It's A times epsilon naught divided by D. It has units of farads. And note that if I want to increase the ability of this device to store charge, there are two ways to do it. One way is to increase the surface area of the plates. 
another more useful way is to in fact make the plates close to each other as possible. Okay. And I'll give you an example to play with this a little bit more in problem set 10. So there are a couple other examples of uh, computing the capacitance of systems. And I mentioned capacitance now because it has an important role when we start talking about devices, we build real circuits, capacitors, resistors, inductors, transistors. These are all made of uh, systems that contain elementary devices. A capacitor is an example of an elementary device. At the end of the day, it's simply a device that stores charge. Okay, so this includes lecture 10 for this afternoon. And next time, lecture 11, we will start talking about um, using a vector calculus to wrap up some ideas of electrostatics. Uh, we'll start talking about electro electric dipole moments, what they are, why they're important. And we'll talk about the boundary conditions that electric fields must obey with regard to conductors. So we really haven't defined what a conductor is, and we need to talk about that also. <laughs>